Namaskaram to everyone. And all the little children, uh, I, I must confess to you, the children, I was a good storyteller, but due to uh, horribly <laughs> logically imprisoned adults that I've been talking to for last thirty plus years, I kind of gave up my storytelling and started speaking with surgical precision. <laughs> they seem to like it, but they don't know what they're missing because they lack the limitations of logic so much. A story or storytelling or experiencing a story is actually like a… in modern terminology, it's like virtual reality. Today there is virtual reality technologies, people wear all kinds of goggles can sounds, headphones and they go through a whole experience. We came up with a way to create this experience for people for thousands of years. In this, uh, the important factor is uh, it must be evening, which it is. There must be little chill in the air so that people huddle up close together, which you are. And there must be fire, which we have. Let me see if we can fire. <laughs> so why this fire, this whole atmosphere, a little excessive moisture in the air, why all these things are needed to tell a story? Well, today, see again I'm falling back to logical expressions. Today we know that just above the fire, you're supposed to be not looking at me, just above the fire, that's where your vision should be focused. And because of the radiation that is caused by the fire, and if a voice is well modulated enough to create the right kind of sound and reverberation, together they will change the atmosphere by changing the molecular structure of the air around us. Today there is science to it. But we went by human experience <laughs> because today we understand science as reality is told to us by different instruments. But in my experience, for me, the only instrument I trust is this human mechanism. What this says is absolute for me and it's never gone wrong till now. <laughs> I know it will never go wrong because uh, suddenly it will not shoot up into the air, when it's time it will go down into the earth, I know it's on the right trajectory. <laughs> So, if you keep your focus unwavering just above the fire, Indian stories are not designed to say something and in the end say the moral of the story is this one. This is not a moralistic nation. We did not run this country or this culture based on rigid morality. We always conducted this society by seeing how to stir up your humanity. Because we saw if your humanity is overflowing, you don't need any morality. But in every generation, there must be people who will be constantly stirring up your humanity. If that doesn't happen without the moral code, then people go a little crazy which I think we are seeing right now a bit <laughs> So, uh, those of you who in between go to their own stories on the cell phone, this lady, hello, your cell phone. No, no, you're not supposed to go to your own story, you're supposed to be staring a few inches above the fire and allow the transformation that happens around you to impact you because a story is a virtual reality that you experience. A story is not a bunch of facts 
And in the end, one stupid moral, the story of the… moral of the story is this. This is not that kind of storytelling. This is that kind of storytelling which nat naturally gets you into a place where is, there is suspension of disbelief. That is, what you believe and disbelieve gets mixed up, what is logical and magical gets mixed up. The idea of a story is that you are not trapped in your logic, your life touches some magic. If you're logically all correct, the only satisfaction that you have is you're correct, but <laughs> you will miss everything in life. Uh, life needs little magic because life is magic. Because you don't know where the hell you came from, suddenly you're here, everything fine. Tch, isn't it magic? that suddenly you fell out of your mother's womb one day and you go about like your whole life and poop, one day you're gone again without a sign. Isn't this magic? Hello? Isn't birth and death magic? Birth and death definitely is magic, isn't it? Always surprises you. What makes you think the in-between space is not magic? In-between space is also magic because you got trapped in the limitations of your logic you're not experiencing the magic. So story is a time to suspend a few things, not bother about this and that, especially the messages that are coming on your phone. Hello? And uh, allow this to transform you. When I say the fire, the radiation, the heat and the reverberation of a voice, it can transform the atmosphere. Well, because you know you're logical people, only the front little bit, the children may be little less logical but they are also getting there very fast. So there are… there is scientific evidence to show you how sound and reverberation can reorganize the entire process around you. There is… in the life energies that we are, we identify five basic dimensions of energy. These are called pranavayu, samanavayu, udhanavayu, apanavayu and vyana. Among this, udhana is important here because the udhanavayu within you, if you have little mastery over that, then it enhances your ability to communicate and your voice loses all its rough edges and it becomes a very comprehensive sound that it can have an impact. Now, this is not the kind of impact that you do by throwing phenomenal facts at somebody. This is simply, you're not making music, you're not saying something phenomenal, you're saying something very simple, but still it must have an impact. Because if that impact is not there, your ability to communicate is gone with people. You will have to fight through all kinds of resistance. Now, these reverberations, how they impact not just the human being, not just your mental structure in terms of how you think and understand, like and dislike a particular story, it just can reorganize the entire system. If you… if you… this is an important thing about story, that is, uh, without blinking your eyes, you must be staring just a few inches above the fire and uh, simply listen. And uh, whenever I ask you a question or something else, you don't have to answer yes, no, this, that, you just have to say, hmm. Hello? <laughs> it, that's not everybody. <laughs> Hello, everybody. <laughs> ah, Mohit? <laughs> uh, so Sadhguru, I was… Uh, I'm looking at the fire, some inches above the flames just like you said, and uh, my mind goes back to in my head, you know, and I, I wonder uh, how you were as a kid, you know, what season was the best season to listen to stories, 
at home and uh, what kind of a kid were you? you know, I, I would love the kids to know. Oh, no, no, you wouldn't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, like when I was really young, there was lots of confusion in the head. So how was it for you when you were growing up, listening to the stories uh, during different seasons? Just tell us something about that. Oh. I did not have any confusion. It's just that I didn't know a damn thing. <laughs> and I realized that I don't know a damn thing. So confusion means uh, you thought you knew something and then something else came up, so you got a little confused. I had no such situations because I just did not know a thing. I realized I don't know a thing. So naturally, if… even if something like if somebody gave me a glass of water, I found a leaf or if I sat up in the night, I would be simply staring for hours on end without blinking my eyes. To a point where my father started thinking, you know, he's a physician, he started thinking I need psychiatric evaluation because all the time I'm staring at something. <laughs> my thing was in a way to put it in this day's context. I was trying to understand what is the story of an ant, what is the story of a leaf, what is the story of a tree, what is the story of a snake, what is the story of all kinds of grasshoppers and beetles and things that I spent days and months with. This is not a very inspiring thing for children, but I think they're all past that age so I can tell them. They put me to school when I was just three and a half years of age because they found I was spilling out of the house a bit. So they thought school would discipline me. So there was a maid who would walk me to the school and uh, she wants me leave inside. I threatened her, you leave me at the gate, I don't want you to come inside. So this deal went on, she would leave me at the gate, I would wait for her to go and then I would also go somewhere and I found… I found at that time I thought it was some Grand Canyon, okay? It was a Grand Canyon, in my experience. I went there and I started my uh, biological research. So my father being a doctor, he had lots of… Uh, you know those days, those penicillin bottles were there, you know, tiny little bottles. I… because there were so many of them, I didn't think he needed all that. So I emptied dozens of them with medicine, whatever there was. And I filled this with tadpoles and insects and bugs and creatures. And my school bag was full of that stuff. And they… almost for two and a half months, I think, I did not go to school. I did my research in this great canyon. But then one day they found out and then they destroyed everything. They called my canyon a gutter. <laughs> and <laughs> They threw out all my biological species that I had gathered. I don't know if some of them have become extinct, maybe I could have saved them <laughs> So that's how I began school, so it's not very inspiring for the children maybe <laughs> So this was around roughly in which class? You were in sixth? Seventh? No, I was uh, maybe four years of age. Oh, four years of age. You started really early, the research part <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> you know, when I was uh, growing up and, uh, you know, in the hills behind my house, there was this big patch of green and a little bit of forest. So there was a whole lot of curiosity about the snails, about any little thing, you know, rushing by, water, sound and… Uh, but one of the things was I used to come home from school and raid my refrigerator or the pantry in the kitchen for some cream of the milk that was boiled in the house. That used to be my first target when I used to come back. And uh, do you have any favorite sort of a incident that you would like to tell folks over here? Something… <laughs> I've heard you traveled on the river for a long time, for oh, many… That, that was much later. Okay. Now you're talking about childhood. <laughs> yes. So, <clears throat> mm, 
I think my school stuff, I think everybody knows and children are here, I better not share the school things. <laughs> I think you can, <laughs> Sadhguru. They're not saying anything? That's adults only. <laughs> Give us a louder mm. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So just a few days ago when I was in… about four days ago I was in Baku, there somebody was uh, telling me that, uh, you know, how uh, they're not able to remember so many things and uh, about their own life and various things as time passes. So I was telling them, the important thing about this is, I actually spoke about this when I was in San Francisco for a group of people, that the reason why people have memory issues is they try to understand the world and their life in terms of words and meanings, which is unnatural. I never tried to understand anything in my life, I just drank up the world like a big video that I can replay it whenever I want. Almost anything, I don't remember incidents piece by piece, some things I remember, some things I don't remember. If I get back, the whole thing just plays on with the most minor details. It's like, you know, I uh, traveled uh, this part of Himalayas, the Chardam thing, from the age of nineteen, twenty-seven years, every year I trekked in that area. So the first part of it, going in a bus, I always sat on top of the bus, always on the top of the bus. These uh, buses were called uh, Bukhartal buses because he will leave at four, four-thirty in the morning from Hardwar and to reach Badrinath, he will reach before the sunset, he has to cross the gate. So he won't stop for lunch, nothing, he will just be gobbling his chapatis and driving, <laughs> smoking and his chapatis and everything, right there he will get down and do his toilet stuff and he'll get back but he won't give us any time for anything. So I would just buy a basket of apples and just eat apples all the way along. Because anyway, those days when we came to North India, we… by the time we crossed Vijayawada, that was the best last meal we would have, the train. <laughs> Once we crossed Vijayawada, uh, after that uh, it is alu puri, alu matar, alu gobi, alu, 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 as we go into the hills it's just alu. So by the time I come to Haridwar, I'm almost done with aloo <laughs> So I'm just eating apples all the way. <laughs> so I would always sit on top of the bus because I, wa I don't want to miss anything. And later on when I started driving on these roads, uh, now I think the traffic has increased. Even then there were lots of landslides and things. This is, these are not things to share with the children. But I always drove on the Himalayan roads. I think, you know, I used to touch like 130, 140 yes. kilometers <laughs> on the Himalayan roads. <laughs> People would think, crazy, how do you know, Sadhguru, you will go off the road somewhere? I said, I've been so many years, it's almost like a reverse video in my mind. I'm just playing it, I know where everything is because I don't try to remember anything. People are trying to remember something, that's a big problem. The important thing is, your attention is absolute. If that is so, then you don't have to try to remember anything because the video is being captured anyway. So, when it comes to stories, you ask which season stories happen. For me, it's always summer season because my mother told stories in a very brief way. Uh, you know, Rajkumara, Rajkumari was born, this happened, this happened, this happened. In six, seven minutes the story is over. But if I went to my ancestral home, my grandmother was there. We normally stayed thirty-five to forty days in summer. We were, uh, you know, all cousin, brothers, sisters, about thirty-six of us traveled from various parts of the country and came there for the vacation. So it's a large household, 
If she started telling that story, it's like this. A Rajkumari was combing her hair. <laughs> it started from here. As this goes down, goes down, many things happen along the way. You have to suspend your sense of time and logic and everything. By the time her comb is coming here, forty days are over. <laughs> Where then we ask, what happened, what happened? She says, come next year. <laughs> because the story, the content and the conclusion of the story are not important. It is just a certain communication and an engagement and a certain training of your own faculties by listening so absolutely that above all, this world opens to every human being only to the extent their attention can penetrate. How keen is your attention? That is how vivid life is. How keen your attention? That is how many doors which will open in this universe for you. So story is that possibility where it captures the attention in such a way, it doesn't matter what is the content of the story, who are the people in the story, it is true, it is… this is all the Western nonsense has gotten into us. Is it a true story? God damn it, it's a story and it's true <laughs> Was it true? That doesn't matter. Right now, it's a true story, you get me? So the purpose of the story in this country is more about engagement, communication, transforming the whole atmosphere and above all training your faculties so that you become so receptive. So this tree is a story. So I was just paying attention, what is the story of this tree? Not exactly articulating like this, but you pay attention to something because you want to know everything about it. If you know everything about it, we don't know what all struggles it's gone through. Every time people gather here, what fears it goes through that they may take it down <laughs> Everything is going through. I would like to know the story of the tree. If only people had heard the story of this tree, oh, we would have definitely created a better world than what we have right now <laughs> Sadhguru, when you say uh, paying attention, like for example, kids when they study or no, no, no. anything… No, 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 no. <laughs> Textbook is not something that you can pay attention to <laughs> I mean… I will tell you about my textbook experience. My father… I hope he doesn't watch this video <laughs> He was a very strict disciplinarian. He was academically such a level of excellence, always first, second, first, second, right through his medical courses, everything. But uh, <coughs> I… I was more compassionate. I wanted everybody to be ahead of me <laughs> So all my test papers, I always… Very consistently, I got only six zeros. <laughs> I remember this so well <laughs> that uh, every… you know, I, I hope uh, we're still torturing the children with that monthly report card, are we? Still? Oh, even if the dinosaurs evolve, the schools don't evolve. <laughs> So they give this report card every month. Always it was a yellow card. Is it still a yellow card? <laughs> Always it was some reason it was a yellow colored card. And when this card is given, I see some… some students in the class uh, go… are strutting around because they are first, second, whatever. Some are sitting around and crying because they are afraid to go home. I don't know what they got in their report card. I always took it from my teacher and took it and gave it to my father. Never ever I opened and saw what is inside <laughs> because uh, I thought this is a transaction between my teacher and my father. <laughs> I didn't want to look into those things. But uh, 
for all my school life, I did not write a single alphabet in my test, this thing, test paper, because somewhere it was against my aesthetic that somebody is going to test me and tell me how I am doing. I didn't like it. <laughs> so, right through my school, I did not write a single alphabet in the monthly test, only in the final exam, I wrote just enough to go to the next class. <laughs> Always went to the next class, never got retained. But uh, this is how it was. Why I am saying this to you is, every time my father saw this, he opened it and saw, and he would blow up like a volcano. And he would go through two, three days of turmoil, seeing this yellow paper. And after three days, uh, my teacher is asking, where is your marks card, bring it back. Because uh, the zeros were consistent, the numbers I never varied, you know, I was consistent. But I think every time they na wrote nastier and nastier comments, which made my father go up. Uh, two, three days he is in a volcano state and uh, then the teachers are asking, where is the mask card, bring it back. My father says, I won't say, sign it, I am ashamed, I will not sign this paper. I said, okay. <laughs> they, they say, then you must bring your father. He says, I will not come to the school, I am ashamed to come there. I just didn't understand what this whole drama was <laughs> because I was just trying to figure what the hell is this life about. I was just trying to understand the ant that crawls, the leaf that comes, the flower that blossoms, the cloud that move, the moon that becomes small, big, all kinds of things. And my own chest breathing, and food that I eat, I'm just engrossed by everything in the universe, but nobody is giving me any marks for that. <laughs> I did not expect that, but I'm saying my story was just to find out what is the story of this life? What is the story that's going on here? Is this a fantastic story? Because in my eyes, Though I could not figure what is the story at that time, it was something fantastic happening. I don't know what it is, why it is, but I know something fantastic is happening and it deserved all my attention. So much attention that uh, what was happening in the textbook, this, this doesn't matter. I was talking about he being a strict disciplinarian, evening seven to nine, we must focus on our textbook. So this is all set, very disciplined life. Uh, we must come home, whatever we're playing, by 6.30, 6.45 we must come back, seven o'clock we must shower and sit down and we must study something. If I opened a book, I would find one small speck on the page. That speck would engage me so much. Next two hours I would be just watching this speck this speck would become like a doorway to the universe for me. But I wouldn't read a single word in the textbook. But I wouldn't be looking around here and there. Anybody who is looking at me in their imagination, they would be thinking I'm reading. But one little tiny speck on the page just absorbed me so much, I just couldn't move away from it. It… it took me a lot more time to realize Ultimately, anything you want to know, it is in training your attention, not just gobbling up information. If your attention is trained, it can do phenomenal things to you. That is what storytelling is about, to train your attention beyond your logic, beyond your likes and dislikes, beyond what you think is right and wrong, simply to be able to be absolute attention to something. And story is capable of cultivating that attention in children. So my grandmother told the most fantastic stories and uh, I will never be able to tell like her because she would go into such a details, such details. I didn't believe a word that she said, but it was so fascinating and she trained all our attention absolutely with her storytelling. So let's tell one of her stories just to… Yes, sir. <laughs> Absolutely. My great-grandmother lived to be one-one-three. 
hundred and thirteen years of age. Now, uh, when she was sixty-five or sixty-six, I think her husband passed away around that time. And after that, after two, three years, around sixty, when she was sixty-eight, she decided she will move out of the home where she was living. It's a very large household, very, you know, land-owning uh, family, big land-owning fa family. So she moved out and built a small temple, not for any god, but for herself. She's that kind of a woman. People used to say she's a devil of a woman, not because she harmed anybody, she did anything, simply because she wouldn't die. <laughs> she just wouldn't die, everybody thought her husband died, some of her children died, I think all of her children died before she went, and some of her grandchildren died, a few great-grandchildren died, but she just won't die. So, and another thing, reason why they called her a devil is because she would laugh. If she laughed, a hoot of laughter, the whole street would shake. Those days, women were not supposed to laugh so loudly. They were supposed to laugh in a controlled way, hee 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 hee. Beyond that, they're not supposed to laugh. I don't know how men lived with women who cannot laugh. But it was so, they were not supposed to laugh, but this woman could not control. When she laughed, she laughed crazy. <laughs> so they said she laughs like a devil. So I started thinking, oh, devil is the laughing one, what does the god do? <laughs> Nobody ever talked about him laughing. So, <laughs> all this. Anyway, she lived a, a very ecstatic life in the sense, she would be sitting and she was… when I saw her, she's over a hundred years of age. She had hair right below her knees flowing, huge amount of hair and tears flowing from her eyes and laughing and sometimes singing, sometimes dancing, over a hundred and four and five years of age at that time, dancing wildly and tears and laughter. When she is in the puja room, I could go and do what I want. I would displace all the gods and I sit there. She's okay with that, with anybody else they would kill you. But she was fine with anything and she would take flowers with her feet and throw it to the gods like that <laughs> So, as wild as she was, she was so sensitive to life that, you know, when she was living out but when we children went, she would come to see us. In the morning, if you give her breakfast, uh, this guy was standing and telling his whole soul, the blue-shirted man, please, sir. Hello? Yourself. <laughs> he didn't understand what is attention. No, not him. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Please, somebody take care of them. So, if… The, if they gave her breakfast, she would take this and feed it to the ants, to the sparrows, to the squirrels and she would simply sit there. Certain people who had assumed uh, that they are her uh, self-appointed advisors, they would come and tell her, oh, you old woman, you don't eat anything, you will die one day like this, without eating. They all died <laughs> She lived on <laughs> And uh, sometimes I asked her, you know, she would sit there with tears flowing, looking at the ants. I thought, why is she so emotional about the ants? I was like uh, maybe five, six years of age. I was going about stamping <laughs> all the ants. I thought they were a good game to stamp. But she would be having tears feeding the ants. I thought she's very emotional about these ants, but never she stopped me from doing my job of stamping the ants but she would be watching the ants and tears flowing out. Then one day I asked her, why are you so emotional about these ants, what is your problem? She said, she laughed and she said, one day you will know. It took me over twenty years to realize what she said, for me to experience what it is to be knowing life beyond the limitations of your own physicality 
and your psychological structure to know life as it is happening right now. That this is a living cosmos, either you are a part of it or you live here, you versus cosmos. You versus cosmos is a stupid competition to get into. Hello? You versus cosmos is an absolutely idiotic competition to get into, but this is how it is. If you are committed to your identity of being an individual, unknowingly you have become you versus the cosmos. You are talking about one's insecurities, anxieties, sufferings, all this is just this. You are you versus cosmos, you have to suffer, how else? So to realize that your body and mind, your physiological structure and psychological structure is not a trap, it is a possibility to go beyond. To realize that it took over twenty years for me after she said those words, but this is the power of storytelling, that it takes you beyond the logic of your psychological structure. And when we sat there listening to her, though I didn't believe a word of what she was saying, I knew she never met these Rajkumaris and Rajkumaras and their hair and stuff, she was probably talking about her own hair. But the important thing is, she grabbed our eyeballs, absolutely, absolutely. And that was the only function, really. She grabbed without uttering one endearment, without telling I love you, without even hugging you or kissing you or anything. She just grabbed us and made us a part of herself. This is the power of storytelling. So that's how I experienced storytelling. Every summer we were just waiting to get back there. But I saw her only consciously, probably only five, six years after that, uh, at the age of one, one, three. Till the last day, she was completely independent. At the age of one, 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 she got throat cancer because in those days, women were allowed to use tobacco only after they got married. Before marriage, they could not use tobacco, but after marriage, they could use. So she got mar married at the age of fourteen. On the very first day, she exercised her right. <laughs> From that day onwards, she's been, been chewing tobacco. Ninety-nine years she chewed tobacco, at the age of one, 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 she got throat cancer. She refused to go to the doctor, she refused to take painkillers, she refused to be treated. About one and a half to two years she suffered, it was swollen like that. I saw her in that condition, she couldn't speak, but she simply sat there without medication, without painkillers. And after two years of that extreme pain, she left. Until the last day, whatever she needed, she was doing for herself, living in her own temple, <laughs> a temple not for a god, but for herself, because she felt she deserves a temple. <laughs> See, I have a crazy genealogy, you know that now. Absolutely, Sadhguruji. Uh, Sadhguru, like I, I come from the hills and uh, Lord Shiva is the big boss there, uh, every household, every village and all the little gods, every village, the village god is an incarnation of Lord Shiva in some form or the other. So when uh, we came down to Coimbatore, we were so blessed to see the Adi Yogi over there in his glory in front of the Velangiri mountains, the Adi Yogi and uh, I would love you to tell us a the Adi Yogi story maybe for, for, the, for the folks over here. <laughs> or how did you come across Adi Yogi for the first time and what did he do to you? <laughs> well, now with a big uh, Adi Yogi face and many things I have done, people think I am a devotee of Shiva. I am not a devotee of Shiva. I am not a Shiva Bhakt. He kind of forcefully invaded my life.
I, you know, at the age of twenty-five, when a, an overwhelming experience happened to me on the Chamundi Hill, after that, in the next two months, I noticed that a certain sound was coming out of me, often. Initially, I thought uh, for some reason my breath is rasping. Even now, in United States, uh, when I'm initiating people, when I say Shambho, I don't say it like this when I say shh. People say, Sadhguru, when you whistle, our energies go crazy. Why are you whistling like that? I said, it's not a whistle, <laughs> I'm saying shh. So this sound started happening from within me like a rasp. I did not know what it is. All my life I had never uttered such words. I grew up as a confirmed atheist, very involved in uh, the left movements of those days. <laughs> uh, this sound just coming out of me like this, <laughs> I thought my breath, something crazy going on. But after some time, it started coming out more distinctly. So it's not by choice I started saying these things and doing what I'm doing. I'm just a slave <laughs> And uh, initially I fought, then I knew this is like you versus cosmos game. I'm smart enough to understand it's not worth fighting. So I became his party. You know, in uh, Coimbatore, at the Isha Ashram, you have the most beautiful and the biggest, uh, uh, I call him Lord Shiva, but he calls him Adi Yogi, and uh, he sits there in front of the Wellingri Mountains, and uh, where you spend a lot of time, Sadhguru, this time and the past time, no, no, don't go into all that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we'll scare the children. Uh, so if, yes, yes, sir. Please, please. Sir. No, 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 you're saying something. No, just sort of, uh, you know, the beauty of it that I experienced over there, uh, that was what I was trying you to, uh, for, you okay. to for you to explain uh, just a little bit. Well, now it's a real story, okay? Hello? Now three inches above the fire, <laughs> all this you must do now. <clears throat> this happened many millennia ago because uh, in the mountains they call him Shiva. We'll go by that name when he is there. When he comes south, we will call him something else. <clears throat> There was a young woman in the southernmost tip of India, which is today known as Kanyakumari, which is, we always say Kashmir to Kanyakumari because this is supposed to describe the spread, the latitudinal spread of this nation. So Kanyakumari, even today, there is a temple for Kanyakumari. The story behind is this, this, her name was Punyakshi. She was like an oracle for the local population, who tells them when the rains will come, who tells them about the crops, who tells them about various things that may happen in that society. So she's a very valuable oracle for them. But she fell in love with Shiva, okay? No WhatsApp. <laughs> you, you must be wondering the children, the young girls are wondering, how did she fall in love from Kanyakumari to Himalayas? Was she messaging him? <laughs> no, no phone, no WhatsApp, no message, no Instagram, nothing. Just like that, hearing about him. So many stories wafted down this subcontinent and reached her ears. She imagined him, she created a virtual reality. See, I want you to understand this. People are talk thinking virtual reality is a new technology. What I'm telling you is, your entire life is a virtual reality. Because 
you are seeing life only the way it happens in your mind, isn't it? Right now you think you see me, but actually what's happening is this light is falling upon me, reflecting, going through your lenses, inverted image in the retina. You are seeing me only the way I am projected in the firmament of your mind. So you have a virtual reality going. Everything that you experience, what you see, what you hear, what you smell, what you taste, what you touch is just like this. You know it only the way it happens within you. You don't know how it really is in the sense. You don't even know which is light and darkness. Uh, if you… if you sit with an owl, what's an owl in Hindi? Ullu. Uh, people here, I think in North India, people think an owl is a stupid bird. Yes? If somebody is stupid, you say wullu. <laughs> but that is not the understanding everywhere. In many cultures, people think owl is a very wise bird because it simply sits there looking at everything like this. So owl is considered a symbol of wisdom. If you sit with an owl, and start an argument as to which is light and which is darkness. Endless argument, isn't it? You never can decide who is right because being a democratic nation, if we go for a vote, all the creatures which see night as light and day as darkness, their numbers are more. Hands down they'll win the election. Yes or no? More creatures come alive in the night than in the day on this planet. So, even what is light and darkness is just your reality, it is not the thing. Everything in the universe is like this, your sense organs are opened up only the way it is necessary for your survival. Every other creature has their sense organs as it is necessary for their survival. But now, she is in Kanyakumari and she falls in love with somebody who is in Himalayas, just hearing about him because if you ever fall in love, you know what happens in your mind is ninety-nine percent, what actually happens is one percent. Hello? As long as you know how to direct this virtual reality, your love affair is going great. When you start observing what is happening in that one percent, you are in trouble. Yes? This happened. You okay with a story inside a story? I'm trying to use my great-grandmother's methodology. Story inside a story inside a story inside a story. So story inside a story. One day, Adam, you heard of this guy? Adam? Adam came home very late in the night. So Eve was very angry and suspicious. Where have you been? She started investigating. After some amount of… enduring some amount of investigation, he said, come on, where would I go? You are the only woman on the planet. <laughs> where do you think I would have gone? Then she said, okay, she became all cuddly and happy and uh, they went to bed, she snuggled up and slept. After he completely fell asleep, she slowly counted the ribs. You're not getting it. What do you do? You're not getting it. Ladies are getting it, others are not getting it. She counted the ribs just to find out if he has used one more rib. Ah, oh, it's gone <laughs> So, uh, she fell in love with Shiva. And she did not blow kisses, she threw her heart away, northward. Somehow Shiva caught it. And though he was an ascetic, a yogi, but married, but this heart was so vibrant, he could not say no. So he started moving south, almost like being drawn because one dimension, of Shiva is that he is a bole. 
that is, he is innocent and there's no intention or determination about anything, whichever way it draws, he goes that way. This heart was so intense, he simply started moving south. The community around Punyakshi did not like this because they knew if she gets married away… married, she will go away and they will lose an oracle, a very valuable person in their society. So they tried to convince her in so many ways, but uh, she has already thrown her heart away. So what to do? Either she has to go, but she is a young woman, instead of that she is waiting for the rubber band effect to bring Shiva here. Can I tell one more story inside a story? Now you guys are not getting, you can't even count ribs, what to do with you? So story inside a story, this is stupid to explain it's a story inside a story, you should not, you must figure it out. On a certain day, a yogi who was over eighty years of age wanted to go up Velangiri mountains to see the abode of Shiva up there. But he was over eighty years of age and it's a very steep, hard climb. Even if you are young and fit, it will take a certain amount of exertion to get there. And then people who are at the foothills, who are running small shops, who are selling beeries and b plastic things and this and that stuff, these are sitting at the foothills all their life, but they never went up. These are that kind of people. They are there to make a living. They saw this over eighty-year-old yogi wanting to go up Velangiri hills. And they said, hey old man, you are not going to go up this mountain. This is very steep and hard to climb, you will not make it. Just settle down here, there's a little temple here, settle down here, you are not going to go up there. So the yogi looked at them. These are all Danda people. They don't understand what it means to go up anywhere, they're just trying to make a living. He said, See, it's not about me going up or not going up. It's just that my heart is already gone there. The rest of the body will just catch up one way or the other. So Punyakshi is in that state. But being a young woman, she is dignified, she doesn't want to go. She wants him to come. And uh, he being little mindless, he's mindless. Mindless does not mean mad, because madness can only happen in the mind. One who is mindless is absolutely sane. Yes? Madness can only happen in your mind, isn't it? If you don't have a mind, where is the problem of madness? There never will be a problem of madness in your life. So he is mindless, and when he sensed the intensity of this heart, he just started moving south. Then the local community started devising all kinds of obstacles to see that they don't lose their oracle. But he starts coming south and he's coming closer and closer, the information is coming that he's getting close. So these people went halfway up, met him up there and said, you cannot marry this girl. But uh, he was in no mood to even listen, he just kept going south. Then they said, see if you meant to want to marry our girl, you must… Uh, you must bring… Uh, some items missing. Where's the sugar cane? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry <laughs> okay. So they said, you must bring sugar cane. You know this is sugar cane without these rings, without knots. It's in the nature of this that always there will be knots, more or less, but they have to be there. This is the way this is made. So they said, you must bring sugar cane without knots. And they said, you must bring a coconut without ice in the south. They say, once you remove this… this uh, 
the fiber that is there, once you remove it, this coconut is like Shiva, it has three eyes. So they said you must get a coconut which has no eyes. This is very vital for the coconut to sprout, but they want a coconut which doesn't have eyes. And they wanted a beetle leaf which doesn't have wines, that is, it doesn't have these wines in it. So, what they're asking is essentially some impossible conditions so that he will fail and go back. They're saying this is the bride price for our girl. So out of his occult, he went into his occult dimension and produced sugar cane without knots, a coconut without eyes and a bit leaf without veins in it. They looked at their, this and they said, this is unnatural. He laughed and he said, you are very unnatural because you are the one who asked for such things. You are very unnatural people. So let me save this girl from you guys. And he started moving south. So just twenty-four hours away, they set a deadline. Before sunrise on the next morning, you must come and the wedding should be over. So the, for the wedding they prepared, all food was cooked and everything ready. Punyakshi is all dressed and waiting. In Tamil Nadu, there is a culture of always weddings being before sunrise at four o'clock, three thirty, four o'clock in the morning, weddings happen. You must also start this in Delhi, you will avoid all the traffic problems <laughs> and uh, on those wedding days making misery for everybody else who's going to work. <laughs> all this will go if you do early morning four o'clock weddings. In Tamil Nadu, weddings are like that. So they said, before sunrise, you must arrive and the wedding should be over. Food is cooked, everything is ready, people are waiting and she is waiting. If you cross sunrise time, it's over, the muhurtam is over, you cannot marry the girl. So he was coming and very close, he was in a… today this place is called a Suchindram. When he came to that place, what they did was, it was this kind of season, November, December, when it's misty. If you do not know this, this is something you must experience, you might have seen in the hills, that when it is misty to a certain extent, when the water particles in the air is at a certain density, if you light a fire like this on a mountain, it looks like the whole mountain is on fire because every molecule of water acts like a prism and multiplies the fire millionfold and makes it so large. So knowing this, at an appropriate distance, they set up a fire with camphor and when the fire burned, it looked like the sun has risen, an orange flame went up in the mist. So when Punyakshi saw this, that the sun has come up and Shiva has not come, she said, this is it, he has abandoned me and she left her body, standing. Even today, in the temple she is standing, looking no, you know, looking with a certain expectation, standing, she left her body. In a certain sense of pride and a bit of anger, she left her body. When this came to Shiva, he was a Chutindram and then he was totally despondent and frustrated that he could not fulfill such a simple need of hers and he turned back and then he came to Velangir Hills and on top of the mountain he spent over three and a half months. It is in the tradition of this culture, wherever Shiva spent one cycle of moon, that place will be referred to as Kailash. So even today, the Velangiri Hills is referred to as Kailash of the South. <clears throat> right from my infancy, right from my birth, I would say, this is a strange thing, probably, our people think so at least, I don't think it is strange. I think every child is capable of this. I remember things that happened around me when I was three and a half, four months of age. Simple things, not some earth-shaking events, simple things. I even remember what kind of sari my mother was wearing. She was having conversation with somebody, some local gossip, that also I know. When I grow up, I say, you were saying this to this lady. She would be shocked, you were just few months old, how the hell do you know this? 
Did somebody tell you, these are not some, some things that somebody can tell you, because these are innocuous small things, not some big events. So, right from that age, always in the background of my eyes, always I had a mountain peak. Till I was sixteen, I believed that everybody's eyes have mountain peaks. Only when I was sixteen years of age, when I spoke to my friends about the mountains, they thought I was crazy. They, they said, you're crazy, you lost your balance, where are mountains? But I really believed everybody's eyes have a mountain peak, because it was constantly there. In my wakefulness, in my sleep, always there. So after sixteen years of age, I started looking for this mountain. I trekked the whole of Western Ghats. I traveled from Goa, southern tip of Goa to Kanyakumari eleven times on my motorcycle, climbing every possible peak, trying to find that mountain. By the time I was nineteen, I knew it is not there. So I moved to Himalayas and I started trekking in Himalayas. The moment I saw Himalayas, I knew it is not there because what I was seeing and the terrain was very different. It is only in 1987, I stepped into Coimbatore city and I realized the mountain is somewhere here. How this happened is, morning 3.45, I got off the bus, Mysore, Coimbatore, I take a night bus, it arrives too early and I got down and suddenly this hit me, I didn't know what. I kept my baggage down in the bus station, I sat on the baggage and that's it. <laughs> For over one and a half, two hours I was sitting right there, I didn't realize what happened to me. I knew this is somewhere here, but it's not like I'm thinking about it, I just lost sense of time. It is only around six, six, fifteen, these auto rickshaw drivers coming and poking me and asking where I want to go, that I really came to my senses. I knew it's somewhere close by. I found it in 1993, that is Wellingiri Hills. After I saw that peak, this vanished. When I saw it, I decided this is where we will set up the yoga center and that's where we are today. Well, that's really amazing, uh, Sadhguru, I mean, uh, being able to see things like that, it's… And thank you so much, we're so blessed to have you at this edition of Kathakar, Sadhguru, thank you so much for coming. Sadhguru, I wanted you to sort of, uh, you know, shed some light for us. Like in this day and age when the kids have laptops and computers and iPads and uh, how does one sort of uh, get this storytelling thing or the, or the aspect of stories being transmitted uh, across generations? Is that only going to happen through computers or uh, the families or the parents or how do you see things going, you know, for, for the younger generation? Like when I was growing up in school, we didn't have any computers, so sitting around a fire was still a beautiful option and uh, television was also just one channel, do darshan and nothing really happening. Now it's 24 hours, 200 channels and so just how would it happen? Uh, I don't think we need to blame this on technology. Even before the technology came, I think my generation or even my father's generation and probably your generation kind of lost the ability to tell a story. So the only story storytellers are commercial storytellers in the form of television, serials or uh, cinema or whatever, so naturally they're watching that because there is nobody at home or school who can s tell a story in any detail for nuts. They cannot <laughs> They can only read the textbook. So they naturally are looking for alternative stories. So I don't think there's anything wrong. It doesn't matter whether the story is coming from a phone or a television or what, but 
Right now, the problem is, as you said, there are many channels, they don't even listen to one story, they're watching ten stories at the same time, shifting, shifting, shifting. Now, that doesn't serve the purpose of why the storytelling, because it doesn't grab you, it's just information, information. This crime is ours, because this is how we made education seem. We made the children understand education is all about information. But anyway, a time is coming where as artificial intelligence grows, probably in the next fifteen, twenty years, education as you know it will be totally meaningless. Everything that you can do by gathering information, assessing it, assimilating it and projecting it outside, a simple gadget will be able to do better than somebody who thinks they are very intellectual. So everything that you do… you can do with your intellect, a simple machine can do. This happened to me when I was thirteen years of age. When I was thirteen years of age, the children will laugh at me. When I was thirteen years of age, for the first time, I saw a flatbed calculator. Those days, Sony calculators and National Panasonic calculators came. Sony's were one twenty-five rupees, National Panasonic was hundred rupees, so everybody bought hundred rupee calculators. Somebody brought this machine to me and showed me, tuk, 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 answer came. I looked at this and immediately I said, then if this is the thing, why the hell are they torturing me in my math class? <laughs> why this mathematics class for me? Because all the teacher needs is this. They can find out the answer right here, why are they asking me? Why are they asking me two plus two how much? <laughs> it's all here in this machine. At that time only I thought if it can do mathematics, there must be another machine for science, another machine for history, another machine for everything and it's all coming now. Tch, bit late for me but it's coming <laughs> So schooling as you know it, education as you know it is going to become irrelevant in the next fifteen to twenty-five years. So assimilation of information is no more meaningful because a simple gadget will gather more information and give it out as you want it. So this idea of education is what has destroyed uh, a dialectical and a more holistic understanding and observation of life. Everything is analytical, intellectual, there is no embrace of life, there is dissection of life. So what this means is, uh, suppose I really want to know you, I will dissect you. How's that <laughs> So if I dissect you, one thing that will happen is, at the end of my dissection, you won't exist <laughs> So this has become our way. Whatever is given to us, we want to dissect either physically or intellectually. If you dissect, you will find nothing, believe me. If you dissect anything, you will find nothing. You will know surface aspects of life, maybe you will know its structure, maybe you'll know you will know how… Uh, you know, if I dissect you, maybe I will see your heart, liver, kidney, but you will be gone. There is no way I can know you by dissecting you, isn't it? Maybe if I embrace you, if I include you, I may know something about you, but if I dissect you, I will know nothing about you. First of all, you will not exist. So, this dissection way of education, everything dissect, our idea of science is just this, if you give a flower to somebody who thinks he's a scientist, first thing is they'll strip it down. They will know everything about the flower, but the flower won't exist. So, a story means it's an embracing of life. This is not analyzing, this is not about concluding. The most classic example of storytelling is our Mahabharat, story inside a story inside a story, over hundred thousand characters, everything. Is it about good and bad? No. Is it about judging who is the… Uh, you know, this has become the conversation in… I see particularly in the American news channels, good guys and bad guys. There were no good guys and bad guys in this country. We knew everybody is capable of both. If we inspire them in one way, they will go this way. 
if you inspire them another way, they will go that way. Is it true that none of you are either good or bad twenty-four hours of the day? Is there anybody who is twenty-four hours good, twenty-four hours bad? No. This is the nature of a human being. The thing is, where do you stay most of the time to start with or how to be beyond these two? So entire story is not about judging this is a good man, this is a bad man, this is good, this is bad. This is not about that. This is about digesting life in a holistic way, without dividing it, absorbing life in a holistic way. It is all of it. It is all of it. It is all of this which makes the life. If you just accept the flower and not, not accept the filth, it is just a question of time before the flowers will vanish, isn't it? Hello? I am not hearing the mmm. So, essentially life is happening like this. It is the filth that you put at the root which becomes the flower. Filth doesn't look like a flower, definitely does not smell like a flower, but just see from that filth how much beauty and fragrance has come. So, we don't divide what is filthy, what is filthy and what is sacred. I must tell you this. I was… Uh, somebody came from Australia many years ago when I was still a youth in Mysore. Mysore being a little touristy kind of town, I decided to take this person around on my motorcycle. So I'm riding and uh, I'm a little, you know, always, always hard on the throttle. So if I ride fast, holding me and sitting, you know, very close to my ear, I hear shit. Well, today I think people are shitting all over the place throughout the day, but those days it was new. Then if I break hard at a certain moment, then I hear shit. If they see something be beautiful, oh shit! <laughs> if the food is very spicy, oh shit! Something is very nice, wow, this is real shit. Then I'm looking at this, what is this? Because for me, this business is over in the morning. <laughs> Why throughout the day somebody is saying shit, shit, shit? Then I thought maybe they're constipated and they're trying to invoke themselves. But then I observed, then I saw, they're getting angry and they say, shit, and they settle down. Oh, I thought, oh, it's working. <laughs> Anything that's working, I don't wish to disturb. Then I thought, see, with the whole understanding of science, we came to certain words which we refer to as mantras. Mantra means a pure sound which has a certain kind of reverberation with a specific intent. So we came to a powerful word called Shiva. Even in the word Shiva, it's the Shi which is powerful. Wa is added to dampen this. For those of you who don't understand what I'm saying, we conduct programs where we prepare people to a certain level of sensitivity. When they come there, if one… once if they say Shiva, they'll burst with energy. When this burst happens, you need some control. So sound wa has been added. So these people accidentally, unknowingly, maybe intuitively, they've arrived at the same sound, shit. <laughs> then I thought, oh, this is not a problem for me. When I said this, people said, how can you say Shiva and shit are the same thing? Shiva is the highest, shit is the lowest. Then I asked, uh, well, if these words are stored in your brain, I don't know how they are stored, in case they are stored alphabetically, they are just right next to each other. Because in your mind you cannot hold Shiva here and shit here, there is no such arrangement. Hello? Do you have such an arrangement? Why I am saying this is, because the moment you divide something as filthy and sacred, good and evil, God and devil, you have divided the universe. 
you will never know the reality of your existence. You will only dabble with pieces of life. So, story and the fire just come up, okay? <laughs> and your attention can take you beyond this division that you create in your mind. Because the nature of the intellect is this, if I ask you a simple question, do you want your intellect sharp or blunt? You must choose, I'm going to bless you right now. Sharp. <laughs> so you want it sharp, so you understand it's a cutting instrument. I was trekking in Tibet when, you know, every year we've been going to Kailash, months over… months are over uh, treks. So I'm in a tent and doing some work. Another person is cutting an apple inside the tent. And there's one more person, and that person is telling this person who is cutting the apple, be careful, it's a very sharp knife, it irritates me. Because I call something a knife only if it's sharp. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> uh, you know, if it's a child, I understand. This is a grown man, he must know how to handle a knife, it's not such a complicated machine or something. But I continued my work, another two minutes I again hear, be careful, it's a very sharp knife. I said, hey, come on, leave him alone <laughs> He's a grown man, leave him alone, he will know how to handle a knife. No, Sadhguru, it's a very sharp knife. Then I continue my work, after another two minutes I hear a whisper, you know, it's really, it's a porcelain knife, it's very sharp. Another two minutes later, this man cuts his hand. I said, okay <laughs> See, knife is not a dangerous instrument. Why we do not give a knife to a child's hand is because a child hand, child's hand is not steady, yes? Not because knife is dangerous. Every day, a knife is saving more lives than it's taking lives, isn't it? In an irresponsible hand, it may take life. In your home, it is making your food. On the surgery table, it's saving thousands of life every day. Without a knife, could you do? But if you have cutting job to do, you must use the knife. Suppose you want to stitch your clothes and you do it with a knife, you will be wearing tatters. Sometimes when I see all these people wearing these denims, I'm thinking maybe they were using knives to stitch these pants <laughs> <laughs> in India still they're just leaving patches. I'm seeing in United States and also in… Uh, I went to Russia. In Russia, the pants are almost gone. <laughs> Hardly there's anything left, everything is gone. I thought they must be using a knife to stitch these pants and that's why this is the consequence. Knife is a good instrument to cut, but it is not a good instrument to do anything and everything, isn't it? So similarly, your intellect is a good instrument to dissect a few physical things and know. But it is not a good instrument to know life because it will cut everything into pieces. By the time you analyze somebody that you know, they are finished. After that, you can never look at them with any sense of love or affection. Yes or no? These days, that is why relationships keep falling apart because you try to analyze them, finished. <laughs> <laughs> because once you analyze them, there is not a single human being. If your intellect is sharp enough, I'm saying, if your intellect is sharp enough, not one goddamn single human being on this planet can pass the test. Can I tell you a story inside a story? A lady went to the butcher's shop and a lot of this chicken were hanging. For some reason, human beings have this kind of, uh, uh, what to say, kink in them. For a chicken, its feathers are its dress, colorfully dressed they are. But uh, they pull out all the feathers and then they say, this chicken is dressed. <laughs> I never understood why. <laughs> you pulled off all their clothing and then say, you're dressed hanging upside down. 
So the lady went about lifting a wing and smelling like this and wrinkling her nose, lifting a leg and wrinkling her nose. From chicken to chicken she was going. This was having an effect on all the other customers, they were all looking maybe, it's old, maybe it's bad and whatever. The butcher saw, saw that it is having an impact on his business. So he went to the lady and tapped her on the shoulder, she turned back. He asked her, ma'am, would you pass a test like this? So I'm saying if you apply your intellect on anybody sharply, you will see not a single human being can pass the test including yourself. Hello? <laughs> so this is why you must understand the story. These are all different kinds of stories sitting here. Each one is a story, isn't it? Though they try to behave like, uh, you know, like most people who are walking on the street, and driving their dream cars on the street, if you look at them. I think they're trying to practice their last pose in their life, <laughs> how they should look when they lie in their funeral. <laughs> Believe me, you will naturally get that pose. You don't have to practice it all your life <laughs> Especially if they think they're religious or spiritual, they will become... <laughs> Do you know this? If you are spiritual, you should not look like this, like this. If you are spiritual... <laughs> okay, you must turn slowly. <laughs> uh, oh, the camera's caught me <laughs> Sadhguru, you were talking about stories and you were talking about many different stories in stories. And uh, I was speaking to Kiran sir and he, you know, comes from a beautiful northeastern state of Arunachal Pradesh. And recently we had the very good fortune of traveling with him to a place called Tawang, which is a high, around 11,000 feet, beautiful little town. And there was a beautiful festival happening over there. So we were conversing and, you know, we were agreeing that when we were growing up, some of the best stories that we used to hear from, you know, family people or grandparents or friends, senior people, would be the ghost stories. <laughs> and, uh, you know, somehow, you small, you know, kids, we love to get scared. Still, they want to hear that ghost story. You know, it's one of their favorite things, you know, amongst all stories. Do you have any ghost story from your experiences of... <laughs> traveling in the mountains. <laughs> wow, <laughs> this is really getting him into trouble. <laughs> See, uh, the purpose of telling you ghost stories was not to scare you, but uh, to give you a hair-rising experience. <laughs> This happened. In a barber shop in Louisiana state, the whole place was filled with all kinds of horror comics and ghost stories and all kinds of things, only that. No newspapers, no other magazines, only these things. So one day somebody asked the barber, said, why have you put your whole place with this kind of stories in your saloon? You not, don't have anything else, nothing about styles, about fashion, nothing, only ghost stories and horror stories, why? He said, see, for my profession, if somebody's hair is standing, it makes it much easier. <laughs> So the idea was to give you a hair-rising experience, <laughs> not to scare you. <laughs> and uh, I must tell you, this fascinated me so much. 
that there was a man in Mysore city who was also working in the Mysore city corporation as some official, but he was known to be some kind of a ghost buster or tantric or whatever he is. So somebody told me, I was always looking for these kind of things, so somebody told me, this guy has trapped ghosts in bottles and kept it in his whatever, it's a shrine or a workshop or whatever you want to call it. So I want to go and that guy wouldn't allow us in initially but I was persistent and then he took me inside and he showed me lots of bottles. He said, in this there is this kind of a ghost, this is a woman, this is a man. I looked, I could not see a man or a woman, I all, all saw transparent bottles with corks. So I was just befriending him thinking, I will steal one bottle <laughs> because I really wanted to see a ghost because I had heard so many things. So many things means unbelievable kind of stories. Well, it only made me more and more curious. It did not raise my hair nor scare me, but I became more and more curious. I had spent months on end, continuously every night, being in the cremation grounds, wanting to see. So people come, burn the dead, and you know when with firewood, when the dead bodies burn, it will burns for four, five, six hours. People stay there for an hour or hour and a half and then they have other business to do. They will cry and they'll weep and they will go when it's still burning. Normally what happens is, when as the fire burns, one thing because, you know, there's economic… Uh, always economic aspect to everything, if they've not put enough fire long enough, when this collapses, the out outer part, first thing that'll happen is because neck is such a small thing and it gets burnt and once the spine is burnt, the burning head will roll away, do 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 do. So I am the one who picks it up with a stick and puts it back and waits, where is the damn ghost? It doesn't come. Many, many months on end, I sat there, no ghost came. Somebody said, you put a nail in that tamarind tree, it will come. I would nail the damn tree again and again and again, nothing came. Somebody said, in this house there is a ghost. So I would beg them, please allow me, I want to stay, sleep in that house and see if the ghost comes, did not happen. So I went to this guy and when they said, specifically it's in the bottle, I wanted to steal a bottle. But he was very protective about his bottles <laughs> So I didn't see anything coming out, but he showed me one thing. He made a… Uh, what… Uh, what do you call rangole? Hmm? Rangoli. So he made an elaborate design with rice flour. In the five corners of this, he kept one one egg. He did all kinds of things and poof, he clapped his hand, pop! All the five eggs burst right in front of my eyes. So, I thought something. I don't know whether it's a ghost or it's a thing, whatever, but definitely he did not reach out to these five, he was standing away and all the five eggs burst. Then uh, this was working on me and I went, I was walking in my house backyard, looking here and there. Then I saw guavas were hanging in the tree, the guava fruit. I looked at the fruit, the fruit fell. I thought, what? I did it again and again, the fruit fell. Then I brought my friends and just you idiots watch this. <laughs> Talk, fruit fell. They said, what? Not once, five, ten times I did so that it's not an accident. But then, in about three days' time after I did this, a revulsion, I've never experienced it ever in my life because I've never stepped into those areas. A kind of revulsion went through my entire body that I knew that I had done something very fundamentally wrong. Never again. I said, you want the guavas? Go up and get it. <laughs> you want anything in your life? Go and get it. These kind of things we will never again do. So. 
I realized something is fundamentally wrong, use your energies like that. So what is a ghost? All of you are ghosts with a body. Those who are walking and sitting, everybody, you are ghosts with a body. But suddenly somebody lost their body and you think they are something horrible. Why? They're just like you, they just lost the body. Is it true that you gathered the body over a period of time? Suppose, let's say you had lost control over how much you eat and you became this big. And then you came to yoga program and whatever and slowly you shrank into half your size. Does it mean to say half of you has become a ghost? <laughs> Hello? So if somebody lost the body, fifty, sixty kilograms of planet that we have picked up and made into this, if they put it back, is that a ghost? Then you are also a ghost with a body, isn't it? So this abnormal way of looking at life, that just because somebody lost their body, they've become something evil, something fear… fearful, something terrible, is a very abnormal way of looking at life. The nature of life is such that whether… See, right now, there's something you must look at this, not intellectually, really experientially. You're breathing, all of you, are you? Hello? I'm just checking. Hello? You're breathing. So if you're breathing, let us say this was like a building or whatever, right now we are in the quadrangle kind of place. So there is life here that you're breathing. You may call it air, but it's actually life. Because if I take away this, this will go. Yes? Your life will go. It's only in this transaction, life is happening, isn't it? So it's not just about air, oxygen, this, that. This is a living cosmos. You are like a little bubble, you captured a little bit of life. You know, you, did you blow soap bubbles when you were young at least? Hello? So when you blew your soap bubble, you got this big bubble, I got that big bubble, let us say. We were looking at this, oh, this is my bubble, this is your bubble. Then they went poop. When they go poop, you don't say, this is my air, this is your air, isn't it? This is just like that, this is just a bubble. You captured a certain amount of life and it's functioning in a certain way. When this bubble bursts, there's no such thing as your life and my life. Well, you may not bro break the entire bubble, you may break the outer surface of the bubble and the inner surface of the bubble may still remain just because the outer peel has drop, dropped off. Do you call that a ghost? Then you are a ghost with a body. <laughs>